Good morning, good morning, St. Martin. What's up? What's cooking? It was a wet, rainy weekend, and naturally, the necessary tralala took place. But we will get on to that later on in the program a little bit. It's looking a little overcasted, yet the sun is breaking through here and there. And we have tropical storm girt uh, about 450 miles, a little less now, um, from us. So approximately uh, moving at 9 miles, that's give and take about 2 days before the eye of the storm would be here. So you can expect within 36 hours to feel something. Now, in the same breath, uh, we are also looking at the storm may be falling asunder, dissipating, and that means the winds might um, be damaged or mashed up because of the um, upper atmospheric winds. But that doesn't mean that the rain is gone. Now, it's not a big storm, so there might not be as much rain associated with this storm as was with Franklin that graced us yesterday morning into yesterday evening. And naturally, a lot of people are a little upset this morning that the minister made a call about closing the schools yesterday. But I think it was the right call. And I'll tell you why. Weather is a very difficult something to predict. It's a prediction you make. You have no accuracy always in the prediction. A storm can be here today and gone three hours later. Just fall asunder. Those are the natures. The wonders in nature that we still don't understand too well. While we can read them reasonably well and we can predict rain and certain things, you can't always be right. So rain that was looking like it was coming towards us and it would have hit us during the night and early morning is now more west of us going towards Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. So again, like I say, um, these things happen and we learn from them every time. So I don't think it's a big thing for us to get too excited about and upset with the Minister of Education for putting um, today an official holiday or a compulsory school closure because of expected rain. Um, the Vromi Ministry, that's a whole different story and I'm going to address that later. I come from Vromi and when you get people start to put out nonsense in the press about how hard they work and how soaked they be in the rain, had you done your work before, you wouldn't have been in the rain. Had you done your work before? The reactive reaction of Romy is absurd. It should have been a proactive reaction. But we will get into that because this is going to boil right back down to the trench cleaning contracts. But let me start off with, I'm quite happy that Com took a decision to remove the curtains from the polling stations. And I know there's some work still to be done. It's part of the electoral reform. But I want to slamming and kicking the door one time. So you move the curtains. You have taken away the privacy of the people and they go, oh, that's not true. Nobody can see where you're voting. Yes, they can. Because the paper, the ballot is a big ballot. It's not a small little ballot, it's a big ballot. So if you're voting on the right side, those people sitting there, those observers, know which side you were, which parties you were. If you're in the middle or if you're on the left, they know they can see it. So if they really wanted to make projections, who voted right, who voted left, who voted center, you can give an indication on where the party votes was. Now, this isn't right. So it's either you move the curtains, but the people vote that you can't see them vote, because they can come in with their cameras. They can come in with their phones. Nobody said they can't. And for you to deny them that, you have to have a very good reason. I cannot recall one court case where there was vote buying by taking pictures. There was vote buying in a case because people received money in the police station. The another one, the other vote buying case had to do with the prison where people got lists and all those type of things. But there was never a case where there were pictures taken and the pictures were part of the vote buying. So the evidence that we want to talk about to justify or motivate doesn't exist. Even though we are good at creating evidence, it's going to be difficult to justify why you're doing it. Ritter, for God's sakes, as Prime Minister of the Netherlands, took a picture of his vote and put it on Facebook a few years ago. So if the law is different in Holland 
than it is here, then we should understand and be explained why it is. I am not supporting people going in with cameras or curtains being put back up. I am saying if you're going to apply the law, apply it correct. Don't apply it funny because you feel you're going to win the next election because it might buy you out. Or now the media have to start charging less because you ain't got money as a political party. That should not be the reason for electoral reform, Madam Prime Minister. You see, other people are afraid to call you all out on your nonsense. But election season has started. November 24th is postulation. January 18, 2024 is the projected election date. Unless we have a snap election again because somebody goes here wire. And the writing is on the wall already. But nevertheless... What is funny, though, and maybe it's good for the Prime Minister to come out and say, was it a unanimous decision in come to remove the curtains? Because right now, the UP party has cleared themselves from that decision. They have been telling people on the road because it, they called me and asked me if I was aware of who voted for and who voted against, and I tell them, no, I don't. I don't sit and come. But it was clear that ministers from the UP, a particular minister, let me not say both because I didn't hear both, one particular minister said he did not support the vote. So it's kind of funny, even though COM makes a collective agreement, 5-2 is never a democratic agreement. It's just simply an agreement of members in there. But not all members said they voted for removing the curtain. So it's a very interesting something that's going to happen. I hope that when they say they understand what's happening, that they really have a helicopter view. Because I doubt they have it. There's also <clears throat> the part of the media being so what reeled in on the expense or the amount they can charge for commercials so that they are uh, talk shows or they, that they don't overcharge. So at present, you're, you're paying a few guilders now. You got, I, know, I think it's $200 you're paying by a registration to do a talk show. Two months ago, it was nothing. Come postulation day, it will go up. So the question is, how is this going to be regulated? This is an open economy. How, how are you going to say, it, listen, a, a talk show is not a necessity for a politician. It is a better way to expose yourself but podcast is the way. You notice how much sipping tea we got and this one straight talk. Everybody got a podcast now. Because with a podcast, you also get to the people of Samantha. Majority of the people have social media. So you can easily do that. The radio talk show is not a necessity. This is not like bread, milk, water, electricity, and all those type of things. You can't curtail it. I think it's ridiculous that it even came up. If somebody get a lot of money from corporate sponsors and they want to do it why are you objecting to it maybe maybe madam prime minister what you would have had to actually do was set a regulation that the government will make an x amount of money available for all qualifying parties and i agree with you is it one percent or two percent or three percent of the population that you need signing up for and you do that every time not because you are in office means you don't have to sign up if you want money then you have to sign up show that you have the support and you get it and then you give account for it afterwards that way you can make a law that no businesses can donate to political parties so that they own ministers because that's what you're fighting Call it what it is. Stop beating around the bush with all kind of stupidity. That's what puts us further from the goal that we want to truly achieve. If you want to achieve a fair elections, there are ways you can do that. And yes, it means you have to make harsh decisions. And those that are wrong you, are going to tell you no. Don't do that. You're going to lose a lot of votes and cause a lot of problems. But in other countries, it happens. In other countries... You don't see them picking up money by businesses. America is a story on its own. They also have a trillion dollar deficit that they will never pay back. So don't compare us to America when it comes to politics. Maybe we can take a page out of the book of the Netherlands or the European countries where the state makes money available for the elections and that's it. That's the money you get. 
that's the money you go with. That's an alternative. We're a small island and we get confronted with a lot of things and then we are called corrupt. When will the AOV be paid out to the recipients which have, which had actually happened since January 1st, 2023? I saw a post on Facebook, I think it was, how the op brought home the AOV. And I, I, I don't know if they understand the true meaning of bringing home. Because when you give people 98 guilders, additional per year and that 98 guilders is only if you have 50 plus years in the EU, in the written in the Samaritan uninterrupted because if you don't have that you ain't getting the 98 guilders you're getting less but in reality you're getting 1334 guilders if you was getting everything that is 75 percent approximately of the minimum wage and you're proud man you should be ashamed of yourself you all should be ashamed of yourself you have to find a way to make AOV pension, again, I, I'm, I'm going to keep saying it, it's not a pension that you are calling it. It's a provision. It's a provision made in the law to help people that don't have a pension. Because at the end of the day, people that have a pension that's over 1,334 guilders, you can get much of them. They don't get much from that AOV. So again, but it doesn't mean to say that they have a livable wage. Because the livable wage, by all accounts, is approximately 3,500 guilders a month. Now, I know AOV can go from 1,300 to 3,500 because the fund would be bankrupt. But there are a lot of people collecting AOV that don't even live in Samaritan. That money is going abroad. But you didn't fix that. You come waving a big flag of victory that you gave them a whopping 98 guilders a month extra. You ashamed? Your salary is 20,000. This is 1,334 maximum. So please, don't ridicule yourself by saying you did such a great thing. No, it's not a great thing. It's a step in the right direction, but it surely is not the, so only, the solution for these people. These people go to bed hungry still, or wake up in the morning and can't eat, or can't pay light bill, or can't pay transportation. So there's nothing to be proud about. Absolutely nothing. You should have left it in a corner and not talk about it. And you would have been more appreciated by me and others than going out there boasting and waving a flag as if you did such, you did such a great thing. When in reality, it's not such a great thing. Our seniors are still suffering. They are still being taxed and all kind of things for any other income they have. That you all should have been fixing. Instead of waving a flag, you give them 98 guilders more. Please, man, come on. Our seniors seem to be a forgotten group. I have begged and asked for over a year and a half, please look at the tax relief for seniors. Just make an arrangement that the tax on seniors will not be levied. You can look at their income, but it may not include their pension. What do I mean with that? If they have another income, you don't add up the pension to it to tax them. We do that right now. So the, 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 the pensioner that makes 2,000 guilders a month is taxed. While we know that the minimum wage is not taxed because it's not a livable wage. And 2000 is not a livable wage. And 2500 is not a livable wage. And 3000 is not a livable wage. And 3500 guilders is a livable wage. So that's where you start to tax. But no, we don't do that. Oh no, it's not possible. The law, this, the law. Stop your stupidness. You could change the law to move the curtains. Because it's an LB going to the governor. So you could have made an agreement. To stop taxing the people. But that you don't do as government. You wave a flag. Oh look I give me 80, 98 guilders. You all serious? You all really serious man? Let me congratulate the former Prime Minister Madame Leona Marlin. For her appointment as the liaison for the two. The TWO. And I, 
I'm happy, and I'll tell you why. This is not political happy. This is happy that the Samantha has taken a position that I believe she's qualified to take. And with such, we'll then be able to do and make differences when decisions are made with the implementation agendas and the timelines. Why? Because Mrs. Marlin knows St. Martin. Mrs. Marlin is from here. She has lived here. She has, how would I say, she has governed this country. So if there's anybody well capable of such, it is her. What I am praying for is that we don't start playing political games with a lady as we did with her after the elections. I think we have to respect the decision made by the Netherlands to place her there, and I think we have to work with her in the betterment of this country. I don't want to go deeper into it for now, but if it starts, I will go deeper because I do believe the lady is capable of doing what she has to do. So come September 1st, um, Madam Marlin, I wish you all the best and much success in your new endeavor. Rain, rain, and more rain, and nobody to be found. It is sad because when I looked at the DCOM message yesterday, the original DCOM message, many areas that flooded were not mentioned. Areas that are known to be flood prone. Nobody could tell me in their right mind that one tree is skin down with Point Blanche, no flood. That Belvedere don't flood. All these areas flood. You know why? Because trenches get blocked. So don't say they're not flood prone. When you know that in Cold Bay, Well Road and Orange Grove Road are the two trenches that lead towards the lagoon. There are no other trenches. People, I worked it for 20 years at least. I have a little bit of understanding of what it is. And it was unfortunate because when I saw that list, I immediately sent a message to DCOM and I said, please pay attention. There are more trenches and there are more areas that we need to pay attention to. But what is the sad part of this is the message that came out afterwards. Through me working on this and through me. Listen, I have no problem with selling a story because you're working for a minister. But tell the truth. If through me had prepared properly, this wouldn't have happened the way it happened. Loose laying branches. Trees that are in trenches are going to be ripped away by the force of the water because there was a good bit of water that fell. And you can jump up and cry foul afterwards that, oh, we playing politics with it. No, it isn't we playing politics. You, sir, were playing politics with it. But you stand up out there and you're soaking wet. How much of you were out there when the rain was really falling, when the bacchanal started? None of you. One was celebrating a party, eating kashi pete cake, and the other one was no place to be found. Three inspectors were on the road from Vromi. So don't tell me, sir, that you all were working. You all were not working. Because of your failure, once again, to ensure the trenches are in place, and this is because you all refusing to give, I think it's limitless infrastructure, the contracts they truly won in the bid. You all trying to rebid it now to give it to other people. This is the cause, man. Stop talking stupidity out there before I call you out. Because I will call you out. Make no mistake. Make no mistake with that. I have a lot of respect for you. But don't start this stupidness now to protect people when you know it's wrong. The canal was closed. Romico went out there, filmed it. And you all were still contemplating to throw water into the salt pond to lower the fresh pond. You, got all, you all got to be some serious idiots, you know. Because you all don't have not one working pump in the salt pond. And the pump from the fire department damaged too. So how you get out of water? You all eat serious. Open the damn trench and throw the water in the pond, in the sea. What's wrong with you all? And here come think, you write a nice little press release, everything gone? Man, people lose properties. Because of this stupidness. People have damages to their property because of this stupidness. They should hold you all accountable. They should just start a court case and see where the chips fall. That's what they should do. But I am tired of every time when rain is coming, a serious weather is coming, that you all are not prepared. And please don't tell me the crew can't do their work because they can. They worked with me. I know who they are. I know their abilities. But when you tie people's hands, 
Nobody gonna take a chance. Nobody gonna take a chance because you're gonna blame them. You're gonna blame them for the failures instead of yourself. Another one of these type of things is this article of transparency and accountability in the justice ministry seems to be lacking according to MPR and them. And today there's another um, article in the media by MPR and Dell about ro Romy's road infrastructure, signage, etc., etc., and both great articles. It's just the timing I question. Because the police fight, of which he's a member of, he's a member of the police force. He's just now in Parliament, so he has Freistelling from Dienst. But again, you're writing these articles. You are part of the coalition, sir. Or, or you don't catch this yet. Or are you the boomer? Because the two ministers you're going after, Justice and Vromi, are the two that were going to be sacked. And I know I'm looking for a reason. And I know I'm going to find the reason. That's why I hope Helicopter View, Madame, understands what's really going down. That's why she's begging in Parliament now that everybody stay on board and everybody vote the con their conscience for the country. If you would have only worked your conscience for the country for the past four years, we would have been in a different boat altogether. But you did not. So don't start begging now. You just man up or woman up or whatever it is when the leaks start to fall because they are going to fall. But let me get back to NPR and because I find it kind of strange that now suddenly these type of stories come out. Where were you two months ago? Customs has been having this problem for months. Now that an article come out in the newspaper, now suddenly you're all excited. Oh, I got an angle to go politically. Man, come on, man. Elections are coming. We all know that. Now the curtain's down, so everybody's starting to profile. Is that the reason? You see, the fact that you hit the minister and tell her that she appointed, or the, I, I, nobody else, she appointed people in position at customs that are not qualified to hold that position, that's a rough act. That's a rough accusation. And it would have been a little more respectful because I have done it, so I'll tell it to you. I have called the minister sometimes and asked questions before I go public on anything. Why I think the, the information you put out should be information that you back check. And yes, there was an open letter written by disgruntled custom workers. And mind you, eh, while everybody has the right to express their opinion in the media, there's more than one side to any story. So what happened? Suddenly the custom head appointed puts out a letter that he would have loved to talk about it, but you notice it went to the media. Now that MP, Arundel, is where you should have come in and asked for interference. Call a judicial, call a judicial committee meeting, call customs, call the minister, sit in parliament, <laughs> hit it. Don't go write no Nancy story um, uh, letter to the editor or press release. That's not the way you solve nothing. Sending questions to the Minister of Justice. Well, you think you get answers now? She has to talk to the parties first. So it would have been wise to ask your coalition member, who is the chair of the justice, I think that's your party leader now, to call a meeting and put it there and deal with it there. That would have been the right way to do it. But I understand, because when I read this, I have one question. When is the motion of non-confidence coming? Because there is nothing else when you see this type of manipulation with press releases. The amended budget 2023. This is going to be my principal topic today because I think we have things to say. I'm not hearing parliament enough, so I decided as a suspended parliamentarian, to voice. And hopefully they'll pick up on it, and hopefully we'll get something. But I know up until today, there has been no amended budget 2023 handed in to Parliament for review and discussion. Now remember, it was a few days ago that we had the Minister of Justice and Finance proudly posing in front of the governor's office I didn't see the governor though, but in front of the governor's office saying that they handed in the financial calculations to pay out the police, the retroactives, etc. 
And I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing because the process continues to move forward. Um, that money got to come from someplace. And is that money going to be in budget, amended budget 2023? And if yes, how much are you going to put in there and how much are you going to pay the people? Because saying you went there and saying you're working on the progress is all nice and dandy. But are you going to pay them? Or are you going to come in January with a new year and say, I am making a payment now? Just like how you accused your former colleague, Justice Minister, of his political stunt that caused this whole confusion with the function books and blah, 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 that you had to stand for the beginning and fix it up. How are you going to do this? Because you might not be coming back as the next Justice Minister. So is it going to be done correct so that there's no confusion with it? Because that's the feeling I get that we are now trying to get things done that we don't have money for. Not only the justice workers are going to be a problem, but the liquidity loans might also be a problem. Because come September 1st, I, I don't know how they're going to get anything done with, with the Netherlands anymore. Because I think then, yes, the period of no more um, doing things, but just the day-to-day -day operations will be held in place until elections are in November 18th, I believe. I'm not sure if that's the correct date, but in November, nothing will be really done. That can have a very serious impact on St. Martin, whose loans mature come 10 10 10 or 10 10 2023, which is approximately, if we look at it right now, uh, today is what the 21st, that's 10 days, exactly 50 days away. 50 days from today, the loans mature, and that means St. Martin defaults in payment of a loan and that can have a very serious consequence on our Moody rating. Because when a country defaults on loans, the country's ratings go down. Make no mistake with that. And up to now, I haven't heard anything. A lot of projections that were made that they were going to get this done and get that done, and I'll deal with that a little later in the utter nonsense uh, section, clearly will show that projections that have been made in this budget are not being reached. One, laws have not been passed. Two, the, the collection can't happen. This means, though, that a lot of that money in the budget now has to be re reversed. And by reversing it, you have to look at what did you spend that you should not have spent and what for influence can that have on the budget moving forward. This, this is a very ticklish something. Now, with looking at all of this, there, there are a few questions that we must ask. And the first one was, how much money did you put for the police in the budget of 2023? And are provisions going to be made that when we pay out these people, are you going to be paying them out a lump sum? Are provisions being made that the lump sum taxation will not be as if this was something that is now they getting it? No, it is something that was due to them a long time ago. Will the Will the calculation be made that based on how they would have paid taxes then, they will pay taxes now? So if I was to pay 10 guilders on 150 guilders tax when I got it five years ago, will I now be charged that 10 guilders instead of the 20 guilders now that it might be? Because I only get 150, I get a lot of 150s and the tax will put me in a much higher bracket because otherwise they are losing on what they should have got. And I'm just asking if that is how it's going to be done. And if that's not how it's going to be done, then maybe it's good for them to understand how that's going to be done. I know there are also officers that are already on pension. How is it going to work for them? Uh, are they going to get their money in, in, in a lump sum? And how will that affect? Is the 18% going to be affected, um, um, passed on to them? Or are they going to get a tax break on the pension monies? What is it really? These are the things that I, I think is important to explain because uh, an expense and an income go hand in hand in, in these type of things. So it would be good to know how that will work on the amended budget. The liquidity loans, I think that's, that's the, 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 the most difficult and, and, and treacherous one right now because we have no clue. Telling people you're working on it when you know you are no place close to home with the liquidity loans is a dangerous thing, Minister. It's a very, very dangerous thing. 
because you all think everything is a top secret in Samantha. No, it's not. All you got to do is look at what's written by Van Hoflin to the second chamber or the kingdom chamber and you know exactly what's going on in all those discussions. Because over there, over the ocean, say what you want. They are 10 times more transparent than we are. We like to play the game of cloak and dagger, cat and mouse. And then we get caught in our own uh, games and then we lose now. Nine out of ten times we lose, and then we cry foul. Oh, the big bad wolf did it. No, they didn't. Be transparent with these things. Let the people know what they might have to face, what kind of consequences there might be if things go wrong for country St. Martin in this liquidity loan problem. We need to be honest about it. There are going to be shortcomings in this budget 2023. That, that, that's, that's critical. The problem is, how are we planning to supplement those shortcomings are we going to from now say okay people we're not going to and i'll go back to the simple easiest one we ain't gonna do no projects for 2023 um using operational money like we very often do we're gonna just keep the operational money now to to hold on to things like medical education justice where the bigger pitfalls might be so that we take the money from the other entities tiat Fromi, and and put them over there to supplement because we didn't get the um, we didn't get the expected tax uh, revenue, we didn't get the expected incomes on, on other on other matters. So we're going to reshape the projections. If that was already done, then I think it's easy for the minister to say, yeah, listen, these are our plans in the amended budgets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do we have an idea how much the deficit is going to be at the end of 2023 that we are going to be sending over into 2024? These are critical things to explain where we go. Naturally, India. Where do we stand with India? Because at this point in time, you're not hearing much. But if we have to borrow for India, and the, the total figure was 700 million, of which we will most probably get the 26 million that we own in the central bank shares, or worst case scenario, the 10 the 10 um, percent of people we have, which is then 70. So it's either going to be 70 million or about 160 million. It's one of the two, and <clears throat> that means we are borrowing that money. What does that do for our borrowing capacity? What does it do with our borrowed um, debt, our debt ratio? GDP to debt ratio, what, is, what, what does it mean? Does it mean that we cannot borrow anything anymore? What does it mean for the 69 million that we were going to borrow now in capital funds? Because that 69 million and the 70 million, they're so close to each other. It is nearly as if Holland is telling us, listen, don't worry about capital investment right now. Take the Enya money and let's go. Because already with the capital investment that they got an approval for, they can do Enya. Because for Enya, they don't have an approval yet, other than Holland said, come, 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 take the money. But nobody is saying how it's going to affect the country itself. Nobody is saying that. So I, I, again, these are the type of things that I am missing and I am somewhat saddened sometimes that Parliament doesn't delve into this. You don't have to wait for the meeting to do this. Give them your thoughts from now. Let them prepare properly for those things. You know, so again, I, 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 I find it a pity that we are not hearing these things. You, you heard the Minister of VSI said that he's going to do another program, going to build some more homes, fix some more homes. Where's that money going to come from? Is that money budgeted? Can that promise be kept? You see, these are the type of things that I think still is very important for country Samantha. When you look at the taxation um, in our country packages, I spoke about it last week and they asked me, Mr. Bankamba, can you please come back to it and explain one or two things that you said in there a little more in depth. Now, one of the most important things in the objectives was to reestablish the reestablishment of a robust tax system with a broad basis that contributes to a fair distribution of income, encourages the economy and implementation and control by the Taxes and Customs Administration. You hear that last one? Customs. When I hear that, I had so hope that in the taxation program, I would have seen an import duty because customs does that. Customs programs are there, so we would have been able to collect on that. And the other one is realizing adequate structured tax services. That means create a system that is simplified. Now, 
I think the problem that they were having when I spoke was this fat. To increase revenue and to make the system more robust and simple, an integrated detailed investigation will be carried out or was carried out of the financial system, including tax income. The following proposals will be considered. So I want to put some emphasis on the word considered because according to me, but I need the Minister of Finance to come out and open him out. According to me, CFP agreed that St. Martin cannot have a VAT because the French side doesn't have it. And we have open borders, the Treaty of Concordia, free movement of people and goods. So I could go over there and shop. Can I maybe go over and do business, but I could go over and shop and come back with my groceries. So why pay 12.5% here? If over there I ain't paying nothing. You understand? This was the VAT issue. Yet, in the country packages, and I have it here because that was C1. And, you know, I, I don't want it to be difficult, but in this one here, in this one, it clearly states that in accordance with the IMF plan, 12.5% VAT slash BTV, BTP, BTW, BT, 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 sorry, will be implemented. And this is based on the proposal of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. Now, with all due respect to everybody, this is hogwash. This is going to destroy this country. We cannot, we can not afford a fat. An import duty, the French side was willing to also implement 8%. Why we didn't go there? Why go to a VAT that will destroy country Samaritan that we say we so love? You see, when you follow people blindly because you believe in them and not in your own, this is the problem. Minister, you need to come out and talk about the VAT. Is it on or is it off? Because if it's off the books, then do me a big favor and take this document and correct it. And don't put it out there for people to read. Because that means you're only even reading what you're putting out. If it's off, it's off. We don't care what IMF then says. Take it out. Move it. But right now, it's right there. And that's the problem. And that's what we need to learn in this country. Not everything that's put in front of us is necessarily good for us. But there's nothing wrong with saying, I ain't doing that one. If you're not in the driver's seat to make that true, then don't say nothing. Just hush them out and move on. But I think this was one of the serious catches within this change of the tax system. I know the bigger problem we're going to have is agreeing to what is a livable wage that will not be taxed. It's important. Right now, we use the minimum wage pillar of, I think, what is it, 15, 16, 1700 guilders, someplace around there, that we don't tax below that. And they were telling everybody, oh, the AOV won't be taxed. The AOV is, Jesus, is what? 35% of the livable wage. Livable wage is 3,500 guilders. So are we going to set our system up that we will not tax below 3,500 guilders? What does that mean for this country? This is what they should be looking at. How many people between minimum, the present minimum wage and 3,500 guilders pay tax? A lot. About 20 something percent, close to 20% of your population. Because 54% makes minimum wage, they don't pay nothing. And about 16 to 20% make below 3,000. So I want to believe above 3,000 to 3,500, maybe another 4 or 5%. So let's say 20, 25%. How much tax do they pay? Because that number 
is how we going to have to find a supplementation for that they don't pay tax so that that tax comes in a different way now there are different methodologies to do it uh, airbnb for example was a simple one i just heard them say we have about 1400 um airbnbs listed in st martin that have approximately 3000 something rooms available to rent nearly as much as all the hotels in st martin have so maybe we can look there since we said that we're going to jack up the hotel um hotel guests um room tax to 10 percent like the re like the the surrounding maybe that is something we can discuss with airbnb and tell them this is going to be our tax i'm just saying we got to start thinking out of the box we got to look at things and when the people them um pay the 10 percent airbnb don't come harass them for income tax after the fact because that's what you're going to look to do making airbnb then nearly impossible for people to really um, make a, a, a living off of apartments that they have right now that they are renting out because they can't get them rented any other way. Again, these are the type of things that in the tax, new tax structure should be discussed. Tax holidays. Are we still going to continue with tax holidays or are we going to put them off? Right now, what we're doing is we're going to make up a policy and that the civil servants don't really decide anymore. If you meet the policy, you get it. And I'm saying, is that still needed in this day and age? Who does it really help? It doesn't help us because we don't invest at that magnitude anyway. We don't get the loans. Now, again, these are the type of things that I spoke about. And I don't want to belabor it again because I did that last week in depth. So I think um, we have to know where we're going. Now, you know, elections are coming and a lot of, a lot of gimmicks are starting to find their, their, their livelihood now in fooling the people. So I'm going to talk a little bit because the new political gimmick, good or bad, we have been in government for four years. We have given a stable government and now we are trying to roll out our projects that are in the pipeline. And the PM is asking every parliamentarian to act like grown-ups, to attend meetings and give quorum and vote for what's best for the country. So while I understand where the good lady is going, let me ask you a few questions, Madam Prime Minister, so that maybe you can also clear up the air for us. Four years in government, in our education, is in shambles and you got a minister right now trying to replace the experts with friends and family in the education department and you as an educator is saying nothing but we should come out and give you quorum to get the projects out of the pipeline government's responsibility in accordance to article 7 of the compulsory education law which i know you know states that the government is to ensure that students get a meal at school if their parents cannot afford it. And we know that close to 70% of our population lives below the livable wage, thus in poverty. Yet the government doesn't provide one single meal to any student in St. Martin, but speaks of being in power for four years straight. In power at what cost, I dare ask them. Six years of schools being totally destroyed in Hurricane Irma and still not rebuilt are still unusable. And we still haven't ruled out a plan yet other than we saying it's out of the pipeline but not into production yet. This must be one of those sabotaged pipelines, I believe, that is leaking and the project leaked out someplace else but not in Samantha. Seniors going to bed hungry. And until this day, not one plausible solution for them other than ruling out tax assessments and or not having their money at the banks in time. But four years, we in charge. St. Martin has become the robbery island instead of the friendly island, according to reports in the media and social media, seeing the amount of violent armed robberies we have each week now on average four years in power, yet we're going backwards. Police being taken along 
for seemingly another unnecessary ride for their monies. And now customs are getting upset that until this day, nothing truly happened for them. I mean, I, I don't know what to even tell you anymore when I read these things. The TF minister wants to take back the small man's car rental license if they don't use it, but they allow the big boys with casino licenses to rent out theirs to other casino operators so they can continue enriching themselves. So why not allow the local small boys to rent out their rental plates instead of allowing the usage of French plates? I'm just asking this one for the people because your approach is a disaster. It's going to be a disaster. The government is interested in building a new prison instead of legalizing the weed so that our people can become millionaires instead of jailbirds, but we in power. Our waste management is the worst it has been in a long time and the landfill only growing. Where are the recycling, the reduction and the reuse programs? Which pipeline those in? What about the renewable and alternative energy that this country needs so bad and we are the only ones in the kingdom that isn't doing it? Four years and nothing other than saying we signed an agreement for the 2030 SDG goals concerning climate change. We have pussyfoot so much about preclearance that I will not be surprised that the country of St. Kitts and Nevis, who are now vying to host the U.S. Council for the Northern Caribbean, doesn't start preclearance and let St. Martin in the wind because the aircrafts will go there. St. Kitts offers the same, if not sometimes better, than what we are offering touristically. So please, even the U.S. Consulate, I don't understand why Sir Martin didn't fight for it. If Curacao could have one, which is part of the Dutch Kingdom, so all the diplomacy is already there, Sir Martin could have done it too. Sir Martin could have done it too. And being two countries in one might have been even better. Because the French could have now reached the U.S. Consulate very easily. So I, I, I don't understand. But instead, what we do is we put the World Bank in our Central Bank building. The Ministry of Tia. Let me go there. Let me leave that minute because I got to come for that. So, again, Minister, while I understand your plea that you want everybody to come out and help you because two of your members in the coalition, MP Bijlani and MP Marlin, are out for medical reasons and will not be back in the next two, three weeks, which can be to the detriment of this country when meetings have to be called, when laws have to be passed, etc., etc. So yes, I understand that call, but understand also that those sitting in Parliament sometimes wonder if what you are bringing to Parliament is the truth, is the reality is in the best interest of this country. So when they vote against it, sometimes don't get upset. Like what happened, for example, with the 2021 year accounts. It didn't get support. It did not pass. Because when you read the report of the General Audit Chamber, it tells you that the year end reports, the 2021 year accounts were not in compliance with the law. Yet we have people voting for it. Sad, but a true reality. Let me, I, I, I had to call this one here specifically utter nonsense. I was totally flabbergasted when I read the statement of the Minister of Tiat when he says that as Minister he is still confident that he will collect some 450,000 guilders based on the ship's registry. Telling the people of Samaritan that the government can still pull off this complex matter of ship registration to ensure we comply with the various laws, the judicial ramifications when people break the law, the financial liabilities, is just utter nonsense that I deem so funny, but that I must expose. Because the minister himself said in that same article, they are still awaiting legal to tell us what we can or cannot do. But let me tell you what you cannot do. And that is collect that $450,000. And I'll tell you why. Because the good minister 
has no damn clue what he's talking about. None whatsoever. I know for a fact that the Maritime Department in Samaritan has two inspectors. I think it's Claudius Carty and Paul Ellinger. I worked with these gentlemen during Irma with all the sunken shipwrecks, etc., etc. These are hard-working people. But you know what? A ship registry, you need two things. One, you need professionals that can give certifications and registrations of seaworthiness of a ship and the other um, requirements. When you register, when you give that ship a clean bill of health, you are financially responsible for the hiccups of that ship. You have to prosecute offenders when they fish in the wrong waters in your courts. Are we ready for that? I doubt it. Do we have the money for the liabilities? I sincerely doubt that. Do we have the personnel and the office to run such an operation? Absolutely not. So when you read these type of things, you start to wonder to yourself, what, what, what is this good man talking about? What is he, does he understand what he's saying? The answer is no, he doesn't. You see, if you know the history of the ship registry, St. Martin used to have 11 ships registered in St. Martin. And those actually came from back in the Netherlands and Tilly's days, because the Netherlands and Tilly's did have a ship registry agency and they did have a maritime flag. So there were ships in Curacao and there were ships in St. Martin, basically. We had 11. In 2016, we lost our last reg registered ship. Why? Because we couldn't give certifications that were needed. We couldn't do inspections as they were needed. We just didn't have the people nor the office to produce the certificates of ship registry and all the statutory requirements. Have the, these things have to be in place. The minister seems not to understand this. He doesn't know what we have or what we don't have. So when you hear them talking this utter nonsense, you gotta stop it dead in its tracks. There is no 450,000 guilders coming. Stop it, man. You all ain't serious. You people are not serious. Elections come in here, but keep your BS for home, man. Don't go telling the people these things that the media didn't question you in detail to see how stupid you be. It's sad. But I'd have questioned you down to the last piece of information I could have given. Because the maritime flag that we use right now, if we have to, would be the Dutch flag. Not the St. Martin flag, but the Dutch flag. And for you to get permission to do that, sir, you have to speak to the Dutch Royal Association of Shipping. The KN Fair, I believe it is. They are located in Rotterdam. And they don't like to give their stamp of approval and things that are no good. They went to Curacao to do an inspection not too long ago. And they told Curacao, you have a lot of work to do yet before you can register a ship using the Dutch flag. Curacao got yellow flagged a few years ago, 2014, I believe it was. And it took them three, four years to remove the yellow flag. And you know what it was? They had give a stamp of approval on a fishing vessel that went fishing off the coast of North Africa, catching tuna with nets that they were not allowed to catch and fish in a season they were not allowed to fish in international waters and they got jammed up. And Curacao got jammed up. So please, Minister, when you don't have things in place or if you don't understand certain things, don't talk about them. Don't make comments because if you believe that they are not going to be checked, then you truly don't know who I be yet. But don't worry, you're gonna find out in due time. Let me close today. The fight in Parliament has started where the financial accounts of 2021 were not supported. 
And I believe with only six votes right now to the name of the coalition, a lot ain't gonna pass for the foreseeable future until they get eight to go back to the might is right. But seeing now already how in particular one MP has started questioning the justice minister, has started questioning the minister of Romy, it gives me the taste in my mouth that something coming. And like they always say, it's wishful thinking. Hopefully you, you catch yourself down the road. It's not about me. I am not the government. It's not about me. It's about the people of this island that need to understand what they're up against. Right now, the way it looks, there's gonna be a lot of hams and talkies sharing during Christmas. Don't go mash up the government and take that little nice thing away from the people there. Cause they're looking forward to a ham and talkie and maybe even a little plate of goodies on the side, seeing we can give them a minimum wage, but we just waving a little 98 guilders. Two years I've asked while I was out of parliament because of a faulty constitution of our country and this government's to please work on the tolerance policy and please work on the legalization of weed. It is a strong economic pillar that will generate enough money to help put our agriculture, fisheries and animal husbandry on the map. And all the dreaded sustainability we talk about, food sustainability, we put it back in our own people's hands. And that the importing of foods will be there, but not when it comes to fresh produce to the extent it is right now. This is, this is what it was about. Some people can make it anything else they want because that's what we are good at. We get to spin doctors and they start to spin all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, when we decide that we want to do things for our own people, that's when I think we can start talking about financial independence. Independence, that's a whole different ball game. But become financial independent first. Make sure that your nation gives the opportunity to its people to become wealthy. That's the now platform. I hope you all understand where we're going. Again, I am receiving complaints of people going to the emergency center at night and not being helped or being told to go to your house doctor. When people reach the medical center with blood pressures over 200, you can't tell them go see your house doctor. You gotta help these people. The last time I sent away a man, he turned up the car there on Zegas gut because he passed out. I'm not pointing fingers at nobody at this point in time, but I'm going to set a shot in front of the, the bow of the boat called hospital. You all need to deal with people. There was no doctor on call I understood. I wasn't there, so I ain't gonna say that. But I'll say this much, it ain't the first time we hear in this story. And I know it ain't gonna be the last time. But I hope that we don't wait until somebody dies to fix something that can be fixed now. We have to make decisions, and I know they have financial implications, and I know we might be short of people because it's vacation time or whatever you want to do, but the life of a person you can't just hang that in the balance when you're making those type of decisions. I need to clarify something else too, which is an article I read in the Daily Herald regarding, written by an MP, regarding SSV not being able to assist a patient abroad who fell ill, who fell ill and eventually passed away. Now, I need to explain because when I read it, I got the impression as if SSV should have done more. Oh, and I agree, you know, I, I agree with that. But let's be honest one time. The law doesn't allow them. So if we want to make SSV a travel insuring entity also, then we need to change the law. Parliament can do that, Minister of ASI can make an initiative and let it do its rounds. And in that law also put on how the premium is going to be adjusted to pay for this. When I travel, I always take a travel insurance. But again, the MP was right, 
not everybody might want to do that. I can't afford that. I just took a travel insurance for my grandchildren and myself. I paid a few hundred guilders at be sure at the web bank and we were insured for various things. I don't want to belabor the issue because someone lost their life. But we need to be clear on what SFV can do and what it cannot do. And that's where I think the story was not full. It wasn't, it didn't come full circle. Yes, I would love SFV to ensure me wherever I travel in the world. But the law doesn't say that. If SFV sends you to do heart surgery and during the heart surgery something goes wrong, they will step in. But if you do heart surgery and a few days later they realize you got cancer, you're not going to be treated for the cancer. That's not what you would send for by SFV. This is the reality, people, of how our medical insurance works. And this, if we want to debate on what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, then Parliament, start it. Start it. To the family, I want to extend my deepest and serious condolences. I know them, I know the gentleman very well. I knew him very, well, very, very well. But again, let's not mix up the two things. Doesn't deserve to be. When politicians start to play with fire, they're going to get burned. And when pressure catch up on them, they normally end up in the hospital. And that's where one of them just ended up with high pressure. Be careful, son. That's a fact. Presently, clearly the fight has started in one of the government-owned companies, GB, about the increases which will be in their CLA. They're negotiating the CLA right now, and the fight is, what is the increase going to be? Now, <clears throat> in Holland, this took a different turn. In Holland, they said, we done talking about cost of living. We ain't dealing no more with cost of living. Any new CLA moving forward, we want inflation. We want inflation to be reflected in the CLA. Now, people, that's a, <laughs> that's a whole different ball game we talking about now. I have been in the union for many years. And cost of living, eh? that is basically calculated on the increase in the basket of goods over a period of time. Let's say last year, um, the basket of goods, you know, is, is not only food, eh? it's also rent, utilities, uh, medical, all those different things. They add them up, they come to a percentage that it increased maybe 1%, 2%, 3% from last year, January, to this year, January. That's how they calculate the cost of living. Inflation, that's a whole different story. Because the inflation includes a lot of other things also. And inflation is normally higher than the cost of living calculation. Inflation is more based on the fact that your lifestyle changes. So, while you can still afford the basket of goods, you might not be able to afford the frills anymore that you had. Going to the movies, having dinner in a restaurant, buying a bigger car than the average man, you lose those frills because inflation became harder. Now, is it fair to say, well, the business don't have to pay for that because you didn't have those frills in the past. Majority didn't have them. In St. Martin, the answer is yes. Because 75% lives in poverty still. So yes, inflation never really made a big difference here other than the cost of living. Will that change in the future? Yes, it will. Because it is the intention of the now to take people out of the poverty and put them into the livable wage. And will we get all 75%? I hope so. I really hope so. But that I can't guarantee. But will we lift people out 
of poverty? We definitely will, because that's fundamental to what the now stands for when we talk about the empowerment of our people. You see, hunger and poverty in this country is a very serious problem. And instead of government focusing a little more on alleviating this, which are the number one and two sustainable development goals for 2030, um, I notice that they are not really focusing on this. Tackling the, the undocumented people in this country with the whole signing off of border protection with the Dutch till 2025, 2026 with the Coast Guard and all those things. It only seems to work for drugs, weapons, and, and, and cross-border crime. But who, who are all involved? You, you want to mean it's only the registered people involved? No, the undocumented people are involved too. Let's, let's, let's be honest. Let's just be honest and clear about some of these things. And my problem is we are not tackling what needs to be tackled the way it should be tackled. Seniors are still suffering in this country and we are not doing enough for them. Now, I want to leave you with some food for thought. And today I opened the papers and it says, Downs to move on from the whip after 14 years, Curacao professional appointed to top spot. You know, in Samaritan, it's a common something that people that are pep, politically exposed persons, they are very often denied bank accounts, especially if they were in contact with the law, regardless, irregardless of what they were suspended for. They normally tell you at the bank you're too big a risk and they can't give you an account. Even when you're acquitted, they still don't want nothing to do with you. So you see, judicial effects can follow you for the rest of your life. But my problem is this. We want to digitalize the financial world we live in. But we are not ensuring that everyone has a bank account. In St. Martin, we have big casino owners, lottery bosses that have to walk with wheelbarrows of cash money to the tax office, to SFV and all those places, to GB, to pay bills because they don't have a bank account. They, nor their businesses, have bank accounts because they have been stricken from the banks in the country to do business with them because they are too big a risk, they're too great a risk or whatever you want to call it. And they're involved in money laundering and, and all kind of things. We use not giving somebody a bank account, a reason for being involved in some sort of crime. But the real criminals, they ain't even worry the banks no more. They use bit, bit cash, Bitcoin trade. That's how they move their money. Anybody followed how it was in Samantha here? This bit cash. Fella came down, he put stickers and taxis and business all over the place. They even sing kids, he do the same thing. And they have Bitcoin. That's a different one. They trade in money. So they move money and the banks don't even know anything. Now the banks themselves want to get into this whole Bitcoin trading so that they can get some sort of grip on what's really happening in this, <laughs> I don't want to say informal, but unchecked banking world or unchecked financial world. That's the better word. You see, if we are not going to give people bank accounts, then let's not talk about digitalization of a cashless society. Curacao, the said, said, me in doing that, we don't agree with that. Everybody should have a right to pay in cash. Because if they don't have that, then why the hell are we bringing in the Caribbean guilder? Why are we investing tens and tens of millions of guilders through the central bank, our money, to do that? If we still ain't going to use more cash in the very near future. You see, these are questions that need to be asked. These are questions that the central bank needs to answer. And the central bank, naturally, is not going to tell us 
that that's um, yeah that's a problem maybe we didn't think of no they're gonna tell you no don't worry we have to do this 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 look maybe we need to dollarize too maybe we need to dollarize I don't know but I think that just taking the word of the central bank ain't good enough to move for me hero happened through the central bank India and Mother Bay's disaster happened under the watchful eye of the central bank and yes the central bank eventually realized it and called court case and do this but nobody in the central bank was held accountable nobody and what I understand now the asset that they had hold in Mullet Bay they turned it back over to India and all the directors that were appointed suddenly now scramble gone elsewhere so the question is what's really happening What's really happening with Enya and the whole Mullet Bay saga? I thought Sir Martin was going to be given an opportunity to buy Mullet Bay from Enya using foreign exchange funds, fees that we get every year. We get 26 million every year. We could have used three, four years to pay it off. And we then had an asset that we could have had developed by a JW Marriott or Ritz Carlton, whatever. But we would have been able to do that and boost our economy to a high-end economy tourism. We could have, but seemingly it ain't gonna happen because the property is backed by India. And St. Martin now, as government, have to go look for money, take loans to bail out India. And the central bank just simply walking away. That people is what our parliamentarians need to start asking serious questions about instead of just you know like how the Muppet show is blah 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 because that's what it seems to become I, 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 I honestly I honestly don't understand why we're not saying anything why we're not doing anything but again maybe Samantha needs his own bank I saw that the Prime Minister and I went to talk to the Caribbean Development Bank I think that's a good um, that's a good something, open that door, get to know how it's done. But I think Samantha needs also his own bank and have that bank um, backed by a Dutch bank if possible. Maybe ABN, Rab, or one of them, so that they can back our bank. That gives the Dutch the much wanted and desired influence and overview of the financial world, but it gives us the independence, the financial independence independence that we want and nobody nobody will be denied a bank account you know why because in Holland they can't do it either they cannot deny anybody in Holland a bank account so if they are overseeing and they are backing our St. Martin Bank then we too can do so if we truly want to help our people then look for opportunities and possibilities to do so the now nation opportunity wealth that's what we want for our country and its people my brothers you know it has been a rainy weekend girt might fall asunder if projections are correct on Tuesday and there will be some rain most probably during the week there are two other systems in the Atlantic coming off of the west coast that are moving up to us the activities are going to start to spur up now I need you all to not take your eye off the big picture the long haul August September are going to be rough months when it comes to weather be prepared don't be sorry you all take care have a wonderful Monday and the rest of the week Bunks is out take care